Okay, so today we will be starting a new subject. But before we go on with the new subject, do you have any questions about the electricity, circuits, etc.? Now, eventually, we will be combining our new subject with the circuits, so it's important that you already understand how we study the circuits, how we use the Kirchhoff's rules, what's electricity. Any questions? OK, so for a time being, let's just forget about electricity and magnetism. Forget everything. Let's make a, make a dynamical analysis of this. So here I have some mass. I put it over here. It just sticks over there. So this is our, we have a wall. Well, we still have a wall. OK, here is our wall. And on this wall, there is a mass. The, the wall is vertical. There is some mass over here. Let's say the mass is m. Now, what are the forces acting on it? There is its weight. What else? There is a normal force. What else? There is friction. What else? So your friend says that the acceleration of this object is zero, so the net force should be zero. But if you look at these, well, maybe the vertical forces, they might be canceling each other, the friction force with the weight. But what cancels the normal force? So he says that there should be some other force acting on my mass, M. Now the question is, what is this force? So we make this observation. What can you say? What about this force? How can we analyze this force? What do you propose? OK, first of all, does everybody agree that there has to be such a force acting on my mass? Do you agree? The, the source is wall. OK, maybe. We don't know. Well, that is your hypothesis. What else can you, I mean, how can we test it? So you have a hypothesis, but we have to somehow test it and prove it correct or prove it wrong. Let's see. No, at least not here. What can you say? OK, we made one test. At this, there is a force acting on this object when I put it over here. That force doesn't exist when I put it over here for some reason. Either it doesn't exist or it is not strong enough because it falls. I mean, we cannot say that yet it doesn't exist because you see, the, this unknown force, its magnitude has to be equal to the normal force. Since the object is at rest, the friction force is less than or equal to whatever the coefficient of static friction is times the normal force. So if on this wall it falls down, we can only conclude that the friction force is not strong enough, that is mu s times n is not strong enough to overcome the weight. So that's the only conclusion we can drive. There might be some force, there might be some normal force, but it's not strong enough. Now, what else can we test about this force? How do you propose to test it? It depends on material. OK, that's probably one property of this force. Now, what, what, about, what else can you test about this force? Well, we already know some forces, some of the forces. So can it be one of them? So we already know the friction force. We know the normal force. We know 
Which other forces we know? We know the electric force. Can it be one of them? And how can we test whether it is one of them or not? So let's see. Can it be a kind of a friction force? Why not? The friction forces are along the surfaces, parallel to the surface. So it's not a friction force. Now the problem is, what about the electric electric force? Can it be a kind of an electric force? Maybe it came with a charge. How, what kind of measurements? I mean, what do you propose? An electroscope. Well, if I connect this to the electroscope, what will happen is that uh, the electroscope sticks the leaves. They do not break apart, but they stick together. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you are saying that I take this one. Now it depends on the material, it doesn't stick on this one. But let's just imagine this is the wall that it sticks to. So I just separate it slightly. I will see that it, it will decrease with, this also decreases with distance. But what I discover is that the force as a function of the distance is 1 over d cubed rather than 1 over d squared. Furthermore, we already know that it has neutral. It, it's not neutral because we just used an electroscope and there doesn't seem to be any net charge on it. It decreases, the force decreases as 1 over d cubed, but, well, great, it's an electric dipole. The electric dipole doesn't have any charge. In the electric dipole, has this force dependence. So can it be an electric dipole? Now we have a hypothesis, another hypothesis, which explains my, our measurements, our observations. It is neutral, and the force law is, uh, corresponds to the force law of an electric dipole. Okay, so we can just test it in an electric field. Well, too bad it does not turn. It's not a dipole. Well, another thing we could have tried is that we could have, let's say, divided into two. An electric dipole, we can just divide it into two and we can obtain two different charges. Well, we take this one, we divide it into two, we still don't have single charges. We still have an object that has this force law depend, we, we would end up having two neutral objects which have this force law dependence. We divide it even further, we still have the same thing. In the, in the case of a dipole, if you divide the dipole into two, you just have one positive charge, one negative charge, and the force law just becomes one over d squared for each one. So we say that this is a new kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's not something we can ex explain in terms of what we already know, but we can only, so we just, hypothesize that it's a new kind of force. And this new kind of force is what we call the magnetic force. This is the thing we will be studying. Now, of course, we need to measure the force. I mean, that's the, one of the basic things that you would be interested in. How does the force change with respect to what? Well, in this case, there is this small magnet which creates the force. This one doesn't really have any force. It doesn't stick. But for some reason, this object, the magnet, sticks to this one and also sticks to the screen, uh, green board. Do you know where the name comes from? City. 
a city in ancient Greece which happens to be in Turkey. It's Manisa. That's where the name comes from. Well, of course, now we need to make measurements about the force. And, well, your book doesn't really follow the historical development of the subject, so we will, I will be mainly following the discussion in the book. So what, what we observe is that the force, I mean, here there are no charges. This object, well, there, there are charges, but this object is neutral. The green board is neutral. But nevertheless, there is a force acting on this. We will see why there is a force acting on it later on. But even if you take a charge, let's say here you have a magnet, which creates this, let's say, force field, just like the electric field, we will be defining some force field. And if you put a charge over here and let it move, well, it's difficult to get single charges moving and then make measurements on them. The easier thing would be just to take a wire. If you have a wire, there are already many charges moving on it, on, on the average, the, the wire is neutral, the both positive and negative charges, they have zero average velocities, so there won't be any force acting on it. But if you run a current through the wire, then there the negative charges are moving, the positive charges are not moving, and for some strange reason, this new kind of force doesn't act on objects that charges that are at rest. The force, let's call that Fp, is proportional to the speed of the object. This is one observation. If you just have charges, the, this, this force, this new kind of force acting on my charge turns out to be proportional to the speed of my charge. It is also proportional to the charge, just like the electric field. Uh, this is just like the electric field. The electric field is proportional to the electric charge of an object. But different from the electric field, the magnetic force is proportional to the velocity of the speed of the object. But there is also one, another weird property of this force. Let's say we have a region. This is a region where the charge feels a magnetic force. So we, we, have, we take this charge, we let it move around, and it will fe be feeling a magnetic force. Now, in the case of the electric field, electric force, if you just put a charge over here, the force that the electric, the f electric force that that charge will feel will be determined by its position and, the, in fact, the electric field at that position. Now, this new kind of force has this weird dependence on the speed, and furthermore, it also depends on the speed. So if you have, let's say, if it is moving, if you put your charge over here, and let it move with a velocity v, it will feel some force fp, let's say. If it is moving in a different direction at the same point, when it passes through that exactly the same point, it will feel a different force fp prime, so this, when the force velocity is v prime. And in general, fp is different than fp prime. So if the velocity vector changes, even if, even if you keep the speed constant, if you have a different velocity vector, the force will be different. Again, this is based on observation. So you have your region. You want to measure the magnetic force acting on a charge at this point. And we already know that it depends on the velocity, both the, the speed and the direction of the velocity. So what you do, you just make your object pass with different velocities and with different directions through this point. So you send it in this direction, you measure the force, send it in this direction, measure the force, send it in this direction, measure the force, etc. And you just happen to figure out that if you send it, let's say, in this direction, the force is zero. It has zero magnitude. Hmm? Observation. So for some reason, if I send this charge, let's say, in this direction, it feels some force. But if I send it in this direction, it doesn't feel a force. And if I send it through this point with the same speed, but at an angle, let's say theta with this direction, it just feels a force, which we already established that it is proportional to the charge, it is proportional to the speed, 
and it is also proportional to the sine of an angle. This angle theta is, let's say, it feels zero force when the, uh, my charge is moving in this direction. So if I send my object in my charge in this direction, if I set the velocity to be in this direction, then theta is this angle between these two directions. Now why? We don't know. That is just, it seems to be the property of the magnetic field, magnetic force. So this is such a, a weird force that the force depends on the charge of the object, depends on the speed of the object, depends on the sign of this weird angle, the angle that the direction of the velocity makes with the direction of zero force. So this is, again, just empirical facts, empirical measurements. So now, does this remind you of anything? You see, we have a vector v, the velocity. Then we have the sine of an angle. So does it remind, ring any bell? It looks like the cross product. Furthermore, there is this, pro this is a proportionality, it is not exact equality, we need to put some proportionality, let's say constant, and we define the, the force to be Q times V cross B. Now, you see, if you remember the, the, our definition of the electric field, Now, when we define the electric field, we said that we can define a property at a given point such that the force acting on, an elect on a charge is proportional to that property, so-called electric field. And, the and the, here is the charge. Now, in the case of the magnetic force, we already established that the force depends on the, the charge and the speed and also the angle and this weird angle theta. So we cannot just define the magnetic field as the force divided by Q times V, Q, Q times the speed. So there is a vectorial property, so we just have, we define it in this form. We define what's called the magnetic field, just like the analog of the electric field, such that the force at a given point is given by the charge multiplied by the velocity of the object times the magnetic field at that point. And one more observation which I forgot to mention before, that this force, again for some reason, is always perpendicular to V, the velocity. Now this is again observation, so if, if my object is moving in this direction and it feels a force, the magnetic, the force it feels is perpendicular to this, uh, depending on where the magnetic field points. So this definition satisfies all those criteria, and this is how we define the magnetic field. Now, any questions up to this point? Now, up to this point, this is just a description of observations. always perpendicular to the velocity. Now, another way of looking at the electric and magnetic field, which will be important later on. Now, our modern understanding of the electric and magnetic fields are not as if two different phenomena. They are, in fact, the, the two different phases of the same property of nature that we call the electromagnetic field. And a charged object put in an electromagnetic field will feel a force. And this force, there will be a part of this force which is independent of the velocity, and that part is what we call the electric field. And there will be a part of that force which depends on the velocity of the object, and that part is what we call the magnetic force. So this is basically a definition of the electric and magnetic forces. Now, this distinction will be important for us later on, just keep in mind for the time being. 
Now, any questions? We, we, there is this new phenomena in nature that we call the magnetic field, which exerts force on objects that are in motion, and that which exerts force on charged objects that, that are in motion. And this force is always perpendicular to the direction of the velocity of the charged object. If stars is not motion, in that, in that place, what if the charge is not moving, then it will not feel a magnetic force, even if there is a magnetic field. It just does not. Well, you see, I can answer that question. Because the mag it, why it doesn't feel a magnetic force? Because we define the magnetic force as the part of the electromagnetic force which depends on the velocity. So if there is no velocity, there is no magnetic force. It's not a real answer. Other questions? No. But why? But there is a charge. Well, you see, we had this example of a magnet, and your friend proposed that let's use an electroscope to see whether it is charged or not. Well, the electroscope basically, I mean, if you are not touching the charge to the electroscope, it works because of the presence of the electric field because the electric field will attract one kind of charge to the... T Does everybody know what an electroscope is? So it's basically, you have a closed jar. In it, you put some wire attached to foil, very thin foils on it, and you usually take a large sphere, metal conducting sphere at the top. So when Let's say a positive charge approaches. Since this whole thing is conducting, it will attract the negative charges. So the foils will be positively charged. And so they will repel each other. So this is how an electroscope works. And we said that if you bring this magnet, which exerts the force, close to the electroscope, if it had an electric field, it would have attracted some kind of charges to the top and the leaves should have been uh, separated. But they don't. Nothing happens. So we have this magnetic field. We know that this exerts force on moving charges. But there's no electric field. But how the magnetic field appears in this magnet? But how magnetic field appears in this magnet? A good question. How do we create a magnetic field? So how the, do we have the magnetic field in this material, this small thing? Well, there are two things that we know that can create magnetic field, which we will study in detail later on. <coughs> Electric currents create a magnetic field. And also magnets have a magnetic field. Now the question is, then how does the magnets create the magnetic field? Okay, in the case of the uh, currents, we know that there are moving charges, so probably moving charges will be creating the magnetic field, but how come that we have permanent magnets, like this one? Now what happens in, in magnets is, okay, I will be using some more vague words, so electrons, those are the fundamental building, building blocks. So they, it turns out that they have a magnet. They just behave like a very small magnet. So each electron, also the proton, by the way, but the proton is a weaker magnet. But each electron is itself a magnet. And if you have any material, even this one, the electrons will be influ influencing each other somehow. But the chemical properties of certain materials, this is an example. Iron is an example. The, uh, the chemical properties just make sure that all these magnets are aligned. So if all these magnets are aligned, you get what's called a strong magnet. If they are not aligned, all the electrons have different magnetic uh, orientations. So they don't create a total magnetic effect. They just cancel. 
but we will study them in more detail later on. It is heavier. So how is it related? Wait for a homework or an exam question. Other questions? Now this magnetic field just most of its properties are similar. Mathematically speaking, they are similar to the electric field. So just like in the case of the electric field, we define the electric field lines. In the case of a magnetic field, we will be defining the magnetic field lines. Now if you just take a bar, this is a bar magnet. If you imagine a bar magnet, and if you try to measure the direction of the magnetic field, it just turns out that the, the magnetic field lines just look like this. Again, they will have a direction. The direction of the magnetic field lines will be in the direction of the magnetic field itself and their density will be uh, proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field just like in the case of the electric field. And in fact, if you just compare it with how the electric field lines of an electric dipole look, so this is a magnetic bar magnet, the magnetic field lines of a bar magnet. So if you have an electric dipole, this was our electric dipole, this is how the electric field lines look. So you see the, the magnet, the magnetic field lines of a magnet is very sim similar to the electric field lines of an electric dipole. And for this reason, we call the magnets magnetic dipoles. Now, if you consider this magnet, at one end, the magnetic field lines are leaving. On the other end, the magnetic field lines are entering the magnet. And we just name them, this is our north pole, and this is the south pole of the magnet. Now, let's see what happens if we break the magnet in two. Well, if we have an electric dipole, if we break it in two, we have one charge over there, another charge over there. We have two different charges. Now, let's see what happens over here. If we break this magnet from here, So if you break in two, this is one part. So this is how will the magnetic field lines will look. <coughs> you see, the magnetic field lines do not start on the magnet. Neither do they end on the magnet. They're, they just form continuous loops. So if you just break it over here, they will still produce continuous loops. So they will, it will just like, look, it will be a smaller magnet, and this will be the magnetic field lines of that smaller magnet. If you divide it into two, again, you end up having two magnetic dipoles. So no matter how much you divide your, ma your magnet, you will always have a magnetic dipole. You will never have a magnetic monopole. As far as we know. Just a point charge which has only the North Pole or only the South Pole 
does not exist. There are certain theories that are predicting that they should exist, but in none of the experiments we could observe them. Well, let's see. Let's look at this one. We have this expression. Now, let us assume that I have... When my particle is, let's say, moving in this direction, this is the direction of the force, the magnetic force. And it is a plus Q charge. So what should be the direction of the magnetic field? And remember, we, well, this is not enough information, but what are the possible directions of the magnetic field? Well, let's see, if, let's just give it a try. If B is in this direction, maybe, what is the direction of V cross P? Do you remember the cross product? In magnetic fields, we will be always dealing with cross products. So you should better remember it. Either ask now or review it. Now, if P was in that direction, V cross P would be into the screen, not in this direction. So this is not possible. This, this is not possible. That's not our direction of B. Now, what can be the direction of the B so that the force is in that direction? Well, into the screen, you see, this is our V. This is B, right? Yes. This is B, this is V in the screen, both of them. So it should be inside, or maybe in this direction. If it is in this direction, this is V, this is B, what will be the direction of the force? In this direction. Whether, no matter which direction B is, as long as it's on this plane, it will always be in that direction. So just a single measurement is not enough to determine the direction of B. So first of all, we know that if this is V, then B, okay, this, this is V, this is B, okay, V, B. Now we know that it is well, it's somewhere over here. This vector can be our B, this vector can be B. This vector cannot be B because it will be pointing in the opposite direction. So if this is V, then B is somewhere over here. Which direction we don't yet know. But what we can do is we can just set this up, send this object all around these vectors. So instead of sending it, let's say, in this direction, I can send it in this direction and measure. If there is a force, then I know that B is not in that direction. Send it here, send it here. And then until I find the direction in which the force is zero. I just keep the direction of the, for the magnetic force constant, and I, uh, the direction constant, not the magnitude, and keep changing the, my velocity vector until I reach a point at which the force is zero. That direction is the direction of the magnetic field. So I can determine the direction of the magnetic field. By just measuring forces for various objects having various velocities, I can determine the direction of the magnetic field. And once I do that determination for many points, I can just obtain this sketch. Now let me just ask you one more question, although it's not yet uh, uh, our subject. What is B.BS? over a closed surface, the analog of Gauss law for magnetic fields. What will this be? Why? Well, they have to be perpendicular, so 
They don't have to be perpendicular. I can just imagine any surface. Whether it will, it can be perpendicular, it can be parallel, it can be any, at any angle. It can be, look, I can choose my surface to be any surface. It, it will be zero. Well, that's one way of looking at it. We've, we always have the north and the south pole. Another way of looking at it, you see, the, this flux just measures the net number of magnetic field lines passing through my closed surface. And magnetic field lines, since there are no monopoles, they do not end at a point or they do not start at a point. They always form closed loops. So if a magnetic field line enters a closed surface, it has to leave that closed surface to close the loop. So this should always be zero. So these two statements are the same thing. One is the mathematical expression, one is the in common one. Any other questions? Let's choose a surface, any surface. At any given point, it, it doesn't have to be perpendicular, neither parallel, it can have any direction. But it has to be a closed surface. Let's say, let's fix on the convention that if a magnetic field line enters the surface, that will count as minus one. If it leaves the surface, it will count as plus one. So he, this line, it enters my surface, so here, it counts minus one, but at this point it also leaves my surface. It counts as plus one. Any line that enters my surface also leaves my surface. This is true for every line, every magnetic field line. So the sum just gives me zero. There is no magnetic field lines that terminate in my closed surface or that start in my closed surface. It's the electric charges also called the electric monopole. So there's a single point where the, your electric field lines either start or end. There is no such analog of the, for the magnetic field. So in a sense, the magnetic charge is zero for every object. The magnetic fields are created by moving charges. Moving charges that have electric charge. They don't have a separate magnetic charge. Now, any questions on this? On the direction of the force. I mean, this point we will study in more detail later on. Any questions on the magnetic field, the magnetic field force, how they calculate the magnetic field force? What is the direction of the acceleration caused by the magnetic field force? The, so which is perpendicular to the velocity. So if we have, let's say, if we have a region which has a magnetic field, into the screen, and we just send a charged object that is moving with the velocity v, let's say it's positively charged, what will be the direction of it, the force acting on it at this instant? V is into the screen, V is in this direction, so V cross P, the force is upward. This is the force. Now, since there is a force, we know that the acceleration of the object, it won't be zero. But let me ask you this. What is this one? Is it zero or not zero?
If you have an acceleration, that's for sure. The velocity vector is changing. But what about its speed? Does its speed change in the magnetic field, assuming there are no other forces acting on it? No, the direct, hold on, hold on. So the, there is no component of the force in the direction of the motion. So there is no acceleration in the direction of the motion. It's only perpend always perpendicular. And as long as, it's just like uniform circular motion. If you remember uniform circular motion, the speed of the object does not change if the force is just constant. And well, if there's a constant force, the speed doesn't change. It's just the direction that is constantly changing, plus the force is always perpendicular. Well, to have a more rigorous proof, you can also look at this one, v squared. Let's look at the, this is v squared. Let's look at this time derivative. How does v squared change as a function? How does the kinetic energy change as a function of time? This will be equal to the, the vector squared. Now the left hand side is 2v dv by dt. This is the speed times the rate of change of the speed, the left hand side. The right hand side, the velocity vector times dv by dt. Now, dv by dt is the acceleration. Acceleration is always in the direction of the force. This is the direction of the force. And the force is always perpendicular to the velocity. The f this is the, in the direction of the force. Force is always perpendicular to the velocity. And if you take two vectors that are perpendicular to each other and take their scalar product, it will give me zero. So this, already, this also tells me that the kinetic energy doesn't change and hence the speed doesn't change. Since the speed is non-zero, then the rate of change of speed has to be zero. So the object just makes uniform circular motion. Then the next question, what is the radius of this uniform circular motion? Well, we had already seen that it will be doing some uniform circular motion. There will be a force towards the center, which is created by this magnetic field. And the magnetic field, the magnetic force will be, its magnitude is QV cross B. The magnitude of the cross product is the product of the magnitudes times sine of the angle between the two. What is the sine of the angle between the two? Well, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the screen. The velocity is in the plane of the screen. So they are just 90 degrees. So sine of 90, so this is QVB. This is the magnetic, the force due to the magnetic field. Well, it is doing some uniform circular motion, so we already know that for an object to be, to do a uniform circular motion, there has to be a force acting on it, which is toward the center, and the magnitude of that force should be equal to mv squared, the speed squared, divided by the radius. <laughs> so we can determine that Either radius is equal to mv over qb, or we can also look at it from a different perspective. q over m is equal to v over r times b. So this is one way of determining the charge of a given object. So suppose you don't know the charge of an object, but you somehow know this mass. Just send it through a magnetic field, a uniform magnetic field, such that P is constant everywhere, the magnitude, and see what is its radius. 
ra the radius of the orbit. If you know its speed, then you know this ratio. If you know this ratio, you know what Q over M is. This is actually how one way of how we detect particles in experiments, how we determine their charges. So for example, if you have a region in your detector and for some, at some point you end up having particles that are going in such tracks. And let's say that in, the, in, the same, in this region, the magnetic field is into the screen. So what is the charge of, what is the sign of the charge of the object on the left? This, this one, what is the charge of this object? So let's see, at, at this point it's moving upward, that's the velocity, V is into the screen, so V cross P is in this direction, and its trajectory is bending in the same direction, so this object is positively charged. Whatever that object is, we might not know yet, but it should be positively charged, this object should be negatively charged. So we can determine the charge of uh, unknown objects by using this property. Now in fact, just by, if you know which particles are they, they are, if you know the particle type, well, you can just measure the radius just looking at the spirals. Well, they will be spiraling because they will be losing energy. So their speed will be getting smaller and smaller, and hence the radius will be smaller and smaller, and that's what we observe over here. But you can identify the radius of this segment. You know the radius. If you know the charge, char the, uh, what particle it is, you know, you know this charge, you know its mass, you can determine its speed or its energy. M times V would be its momentum. You can determine its momentum directly by just looking at this trajectory. And that is how people used to do these things. Well, because this detector is filled with other material which tracks where it is. In the old times, it was a kind of a gas that we used, so it was hitting the gas molecules and hence transferring some of its energy to the gas molecule. Okay, let's give a 10 minute break now and then we can continue. <laughs>